Anyhow, um, so how do we start this thing? Oh, yeah, that's right. Proverbs. That's right. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and turn our book to Proverbs, our Bible. And let me go ahead and get this over here. We're in Proverbs 24. Now, even though we're in 24, we're still about another, um, we're about halfway through the 30, 32 sayings, depending on how you break it up. So we'll be in Proverbs 24 for probably some time still, and then we'll pick up the pace a little bit, and then we'll eventually uh, get to end of Proverbs, but I'm going to spend a good amount of time in Proverbs 30 and 31. Um, definitely two of my favorite Proverbs. I want to make sure they give them due justice and make sure we have a good understanding of that before we move on to something different after Proverbs. I haven't decided yet, but I have an inclination. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their minds devise violence, and their lips talk of trouble. Now, this is not new in the book of Proverbs, right? There have been several times in which the Proverbs have waxed um, warning-wise as far as who you hang out with, who becomes your friends, who are your influencers, so it's a warning against envy and covetousness. But the idea here is why. It's not so much the warning against it. Does Paul, does Paul, does the writer of Proverbs, I got Philippians on the mind. Um, does the writer of Proverbs, probably Solomon, refer to the law? We're going to be talking about this for the next two hours as well. Because there is both law principles, there is both um, pragmatic principles, and there is also ways of going about handling behavior change. The writer does not invoke the law. He invokes a pragmatic and warning comes from observational reasoning. Why? What, what does it say? Um, well, actually, I don't have my Bible open to Proverbs. <laughs> I'm like, my, my screen changed, so I can't go back and read it. One moment. Perhaps I should follow my own advice, right? Do not be envious of evil men, for their mind devises violence, and their lips talk of trouble. Is that a godly observation, or is that simply pragmatic? If you hang around with individuals like this, what do you start to act like? And is that what you want? Now, there is a population of the world that says, that's exactly what I want to act like. And they hang around with those people because they want to try to emulate their activity. But a, a person who's reading the book of Proverbs generally would go, no, that's not what I want. So therefore, don't hang around with them. You have to make decisions over who becomes your friends and influencers. Otherwise, you start acting like those people. And, and the writer of Proverbs is simply making the observation, don't act like these guys because this is how they are, and therefore you will start to act like them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word, allowing us to read it, to muse upon it, to understand it. Give us the opportunity to um, to, to share these, these principles with people, not from a, a righteous standpoint, but from your wisdom. We thank you that we have it. Help us to think about it. Help us to change our minds. Help us to actually go through the process of pondering your word, meditating on it, thinking about it, so that it brings about a mental change with how we think about the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Philippians. Now we're beginning the last chapter. Doesn't it seem to be too quick? I'm not sure about you. Even though we had the whole, you know, a weird COVID situation and being having to be separate and not me talking to an empty room is always felt weird, but it still seems like we haven't been in Philippians all that long. And so we're beginning the last chapter, but it, it will take us some time to get through verse nine. Not gonna lie. Okay. We have to go ahead and make sure that we, uh, you know, treat it with the care and with the, uh, the attention it deserves because there's a lot of information in here and it's all encapsulated very concisely, and because of the distance of time, because of the distance of geography, the distance of culture, and just overall biblical concepts, we have to slow down at certain points in Scripture and make sure that we kind of really take it in and understand these words. And what words precisely? Well, these words. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is loving, whatever is reputable. If there is any virtue, if there's any commendation, dwell on these things. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. So how many lessons are in there? Now, I will try to be concise. I could honestly go, whatever is true, let's go ahead and deal with true for an hour. I could. I'm trying to be a little bit more concise. I've already had a lot of these word studies done. I've been working on this for some time and trying to put it into a concise message where I'm spending you know, 10, 15 minutes per word rather than 30, 45 minutes per word is actually quite challenging. And actually, um, Today's lesson, the first hour, I was going to really wrap it up very quickly just so I could get into verse 4. You know how you get, right? You get into a certain passage of Scripture. Can we just skip this? I really don't want to sit there and spend any time on this. But after considering it, and I was going to go ahead and do a 10, 15-minute thing on, on, on Philippians 4, 2 through, 2 through 3, I had to take a step back, look at it again, and go, there's a valuable lesson that we cannot overlook. And there's something here that I was going to overlook if I was going to treat it with haste. And so we're going to spend this first hour dealing with Philippians 4, 2 through 3, which is I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyk, 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 I don't know. Um, I, I even read it in Greek. You're going, eh, one or the other. To live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask all you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There's actually some uniqueness to this passage. And even though it's a shift in the text, I want to stop here and just make a few observations. That doesn't look different to you. It looks faded. I don't know. It's just me. I look over here and go, Sarah thinks I need glasses, but I don't think glasses is going to help that at all. It's weird. Anyway, a few observations. Just take a look at this for a second. Dwell on the words for a moment. Make a few observations in your head. There should be ones that are obvious and certain ones that should be obvious, but we don't always think about it. First of all, who are these people? I'll let you know. We don't know. We have no idea. These are the only time they're mentioned. All three major names, the, the two women and also Clement, um, that we don't know who they are. Now, everyone says, oh, this is Clement so-and-so from other different. No, it's a different Clement, right? Different time frame altogether. And so these individuals, we have no idea who they are. But isn't this a strange place for the text? You just got through with an exhortation all the way through 4.1. And then in verse 4, you have, and beginning in verse 4 through 9, you have this excellent um, kind of almost like a benediction filled with theological terms and ideas and challenges. But then you have this two-verse break talking about individuals who need help. One of the biggest concerns I have about this is this. Um, dealing with this particular passage, we have the NASB translation. Now, if anybody has a different translation, King James, New King James, NIV, Holman Christian Standard, any of those, you're going to have something different here. New American Standard botched it horribly, all right, which, you know, almost caused me to go, you know what, we're, we're done with this translation. But... Um, I still think it's the best translation for readability and for literalness, but occasionally you run into these translations which are just frustrating. Um, you have the idea of who is Paul addressing in the True Companion. Who is that? Who is the True Companion? A lot of people have different ideas. In fact, somebody says, oh, that's his name. That's his name? Okay. They don't they want to capitalize True Companion. Translated. Um, who sh they, they, they was women shared in the struggle. In the cause of the gospel. Now, if you take a look at the NASB translation, what is the what is the overall uh, thought? What is the problem between what's going on in Philippi? What does it look like? It looks like there's a cat fight going on, right? It looks like there's two women who just hate each other, and they just need to live in harmony. And so, 
it really kind of when you when you have the mistranslation of live in harmony, you, you really kind of miss the point of what's actually happening here. And what you actually going to find out, because I, I was looking at this going four, two, two, three fits perfectly in chapter one between verses 27 and chapter two, verse four. Why isn't it there? Usually, if you're going to deal with this type of content, you would find it within the context of where it, the similar words being used. That would be a good spot for this. Why is it here? And I'm going to tell you why it's here, what I've kind of looked at and discovered. I believe this is actually the point of chapter 3 and chapter 4. This is the issue of chapter 3 and chapter 4. That this is not some type of isolated incident. He's not just breaking away. And so the shift in the text, yes, it's a shift in the text between diatribe in chapter 3 and then challenge in 4, 4 through 9. But I think this is actually the linchpin between the two texts. Why do I say that? Well, um, because I believe that this is the problem with these two women, is chapter three. And I believe that the specific solution to their problem is found in four, four through nine. If you, can, you can understand what the problem is and kind of see where he, he, they should be thinking. And then you can go forward and kind of get the actual resolution but there is a problem within this particular two individuals, which Paul is addressing. And if I had to guess, now this is part of my observations within the text. Some people think these are, this is a completely isolated incident. But I still have to ask the question, why is it here then? Why is it not in the front? Why is this not near the end? You know, there are times in which Paul challenges individuals, which he puts at the end of the letter, you know? Uh, you see that in the, the book of uh, um, in the book of Colossians. You see certain challenges to individuals at the end of the letter, kind of separate from the entire content. This is in smack in the middle of the content. Why? Because I think this is the problem. Let's go ahead and get into it a little bit. So, so Paul moves from his example of mental attitude and motivation and opposition from those who believe that they do in the flesh um, what they do in the flesh themselves. Challenge, uh, basically approve, makes them approved by God before it makes them justified by God what they do. Um, so he looks at this and says, I think he goes concerning these two people, this is their problem. That's my overall thought. So, but first let's go ahead and ask this question. Why mention these people by name? Why? Why should we go ahead and say, does Paul just want to call somebody out? Paul does this on a regular basis. We know that we have direct letters to individuals, right? We have Timothy, we have Titus. Going over into um, uh, Philemon, we have Colossians, which mentions specific people by name. So we have this, uh, an abundance of information of individuals, sometimes only mentioned once in Scripture, sometimes mentioned repeated times. So having individuals mentioned by name is not always a big deal, but whenever that happens, I do like to make sure that... Did it just change? Yes. See, I knew there was something wrong. This was not plugged in fully. I want an apology from you. <laughs> Your eyes are going bad. There's nothing wrong with that screen. <laughs> we have this running joke within our family. It's basically that I... I, I <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll leave it there. <laughs> I lost that argument. Was I, why, why so in dealing with mentioning people by name, um, there is a purpose or a reason behind this. For us, and I kind of want to look at this as kind of like how, how we look at this and how other people do this. For us, um, for the church in Philippi and for those mentioned. So looking at it from the kind of like an outward in scenario. How would this affect us? Well, I think it does two things for us when we read the letter. First, it makes the letter re relatable. Understand that there are real people with real struggles in need of both instruction and encouragement. That tells us that when we are struggling or we want to help somebody who's struggling, it's not unusual. First century believers who've had direct communication and contact with the apostles had issues and so therefore when we have issues it should not be that big of a deal 
We know that there's issues. We know that there's conflict or there's either or disagreements that we need to go ahead and, and deal with. And scripture helps us understand how to deal with those problems. Second, it validates the letter by placing specific people with specific situations. If somebody were to fabricate a letter to the Philippians and said, oh, I want these two women and Clement and, and all these individuals to, to think better. Because those people don't exist. What are you talking about? You know, I was just in Philippi. Uh, you don't know what you're you don't know what you're talking about. It's easy to kind of um, throw it out and say this is this is fraud. But when you have specific people or what, like within the narrative, specific locations with specific areas that um, that people that people made markers or there's individuals or where they're from, you can go back as a historian, especially around the time that it was written, and validate the information. And so, therefore, mentioning people in specific locations brings validation to the book. For the church who received this letter, it shows that both God and Paul were concerned about them as individuals, even though not everybody's mentioned. But when God is dealing with a specific problem within the church, God has taken a particular notice and, was, and the apostle as well, and it kind of gives them that understanding that God is a personal God, not a God who is just simply giving generalistic uh, ideals to the world. For the individuals addressed, God has taken notice of their struggle and is addressing them directly. How would you take that? Can you imagine being one of the two women? I'm going... We need to figure this out. We need to understand this. I think the same thing would happen when Timothy was dealing with uh, various different individuals who were also on the outs and how, they, how Paul was taking care of them. These two uh, people addressed our feminine names. Right? So it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a question. However, during the times from about 400 AD all the way up and even to the now, there are a certain population of believers that really look down upon women. Seriously, it, it, it's, it's within the history. And the fact is that some people try to masculinize these two names and say, well, Paul is actually addressing men. Why? Why, why would they try to do this? Because they don't believe that women, honestly, we went to a church. Remember this? That um, we went to a Bible study in a church and we sat down and they were talking and a woman asked a question. It was a good question. Pastor responded. They answered the question. On the way home was traveling up there and he goes, I want to sorry for the disorder we had today in church. I'm like, what disorder was that? When the woman was speaking out of turn. I'm like, have a good day. I'm not going back there again. I was like, I was in shock. I really was that they felt that that was both inappropriate and just, and it was the most distracting thing they've ever experienced in their life. I'm like, that was absolutely that, that people think this way still, and it's wrong. So when you're dealing with actually people being mentioned that are that are in the Bible, they want to try to change the text in order to try to uh, limit the uh, the the interaction that both sexes have within the church. And I don't, I don't know what Bible they're reading, but the Bible was groundbreaking and culture shattering when it comes down to the role of women within both the, uh, the concept of just the family and in ministry. Now, is there limitations within the gender role? Absolutely, but that's because it's supposed to emulate the, the family roles. Um, so in Israel and Greece, the role of women was lessened in, in roles of politics, social structure, and religious circles. Not just within, um, you know, people like always try to say that Christianity is an anti-woman religion. During the first century, it was anti-woman. They were property. And you can, and then certain roles in, within women had prominence, but that was with great cost and it's very unique situations within Roman Empire, also within the Greece, and, and also Israel. Now, how many prominent women do you know from Israel during the time of the first century outside of Christianity? None that I can think of. The Bible, however, puts a different emphasis and, and kind of breaks that wall down a little bit because that was not the intent. Husband and wives are supposed to be worked together. 
they're one flesh, not subordinate. And also within the, the Bible and within churches, women are supposed to have an active role, not just sit there and be quiet. That is completely not stated within scriptures, but people somehow, because of inferiority complexes or whatever it may be, I can't speak to the actual motivation, have actually tried to limit the concept of women being addressed within the Bible. I don't want to have speak on this too much, but it's, it does need it is it is necessary to kind of bring out the fact that women are mentioned directly and are shared in the struggle with Paul for the gospel indicates that there is a cultural shift brought about by biblical Christianity that cannot be understated. As to the encouragement in verse two, the NASB has chosen to take a phrase and treat it as an idiom. Uh, so in dealing with textual, ver textual verification, we want to make sure that we get the right message that's being portrayed. Um, here is the, the text in question, to live in harmony in the Lord. And I'll go ahead and just pull up. This is one of my programs that I like. Uh, it gives me like a quick view of the text. By the way, you can do this in my program here. And uh, I like the way this is set up. But if you're also in, if you have Logos, you have what we have provided, then you can do something like this as well. It just won't be as clean. But notice it says, okay, I encourage twice. The same thing to think in the Lord. The word that we're looking at for think, which in this particular context, it's a forneto word, is translated in the ASB as live in harmony. Why? In fact, if you're going to, if you're going to, um, be literal with this text, you would say that I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyk to live in harmony in the Lord or to think in this, the same thing in the Lord. Now, is harmony a problem if they're not thinking the same thing? Do you have, if you're not thinking the same way, as and we got to talk about who we're talking about here, um, is there going to be disharmony? Sure. Um, when Luther comes over and we were watching, you know, the Chiefs and the 49ers, and we both think differently about the teams, there is disharmony between us. But it's, it's true, though, that when you have different views, um, right now, we live in a society right now that if, if you don't think the way I do, then I'm just emotionally charged over it. Today, thinking something different is a lot more complex and a lot more dangerous than even thinking something different 10 years ago. For some reason, um, thoughts have become more problematic than actual physical crime. Joe, Joe, I did a quick little sidestep here. Did you hear about this? It's a couple of years ago, and there was a guy that shot up a church in the Carolinas, either North or South Carolina. And an individual came on the news and said, you know what? I did not believe in the death penalty until I read what he wrote. Not the crime of shooting up the church and killing six or seven people, but what he wrote was so bad that he deserves the death penalty. I'm going, you got that backwards, dude. You know, what you write can be bad and at times can be incendiary and also um, actually crime. But what you do should be what is actually going to be causing of the death penalty by killing six people. Killing six people, not worth the death penalty. Calling people bad names, oh, definitely worth the death penalty now. That's horrible. See, we live in this strange, backwards world right now. But in this context, we have a, a thought, a problem in thinking that is causing a problem. Now, what is that problem exactly? Well... Um, what we don't know is, is what is exactly going on with these two women, unless it's contextual, unless what I kind of pre, pre, uh, started out with is actually the problem is dealing with chapter three. Are they thinking after that? So before we get that, I want to show you how this word is used, um, to think the same thing. That's basically the Greek term. Okay. So basically. Eleven and Philippians two two, 
all had the same phrase. Let's just turn over to Philippians 2.2, 2, and you, because all of them translate it the same way. In Philippians 2.2, 2, it says, Make my joy complete by being of the what? same mind. And remember, we taught this. Okay, we said we didn't say this to be of the same mind. It was to think the same thing, to be unified in thought. How are you unified in thought? Are you supposed to come to my side? Or am I supposed to go to your side? Any thoughts on that? Yes. Neither. Whose thoughts? God's thoughts. If you're having a trouble with a disagreement or a or a, a, a doctrinal disagreement, who are you supposed to come? What side? Whoever argues the best. No, you're supposed to go to God's word and have that become your new thought. And so in this situation, the problem, are they arguing within each other? It's a possibility. They're arguing among themselves. Um, or are they dealing with um, are they dealing with the church? Now, What's the disharmony? What is it they're not thinking about? Well, I think there's two choices here. Paul does not want to be specific. And so he has Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, on an island by itself. Paul doesn't want to be specific. He just throws this in here as a random challenge, or it's contextual. It's within the context of the entire book. Now, if it's within the context, we have, a, we have to look at the entire section of Scripture from chapter 3, verse 2, all the way through 4, 9. To kind of see what the problem is. Chapter 3 is the admonishment. Chapter 3 is the problem. And their problem is being uh, is, is dealing with in generalities in chapter 3. And then brought home to the individuals who have this issue in chapter 4. Their problem is that they have fallen or are falling for the lie of legalism. And they need to realign their mind to the righteousness of God. To pursue, to pursue the goal of the upward call, to follow the example of Paul and others, and do not be an enemy of the cross. Now that sounds kind of harsh, does it not? Do we know of other individuals throughout Scripture who have fallen for that lie, who have severed themselves from grace, who have fallen from grace, who severed themselves from Christ, who have basically uh, denounced salvation by grace and living their life by grace in the Bible. Do we have that example at all? I just quoted several verses from the book of Galatians. This is not unusual, and it actually becomes a problem within the churches on a regular basis. This is the main issue that Paul is fighting in many of his books. If, it's, if he does not want to be specific, then we basically look at this as generalistic concept and say, okay, where there's a problem. He doesn't want to be specific, and he's just going to, be, he's going to state a solution that I still think needs to be within the context. I don't think Paul ever, as far as I can tell, ever just does this kind of like random thought in the middle of something without looking at the entire context of the letter. He's not you know, schizophrenic, and a, a good word I learned a long time ago, he's not capricious. He's speaking for God through the Holy Spirit, and God is not just going to throw something in there that is, that is basically unusable by us. Unless I think in the greeting or the salutation. Like when he says to Timothy, Timothy, bring my coat and my books. Okay. It brings out certain flavors of it, but it's not within the context of the book. It's at the end. You see what I'm talking about? So what is the problem? Either we're going to look at the situation specifically within the context of Philippians 3 and 4, or we're going to look at the problem as generalistic, and we don't know what the problem is, but he still gives us the solution. And I would say that either way is okay as long as you're looking at the solution um, of, the, of the problem. And the problem is, or the solution would be what? We know what they should not do Philippians from Philippians 3. So that could be with the part of the uh, solution. Don't do these things. Um, but if Paul is being vague, then we have a general uh, problem with a general solution. And what is the solution? It's in verse 2. We've already talked about it. Think the same thing. The solution, regardless of the problem, is to think the same thing. Does that solution fit every problem within the body of Christ? 
I would even say it extends beyond that, right? How do you fix any problems? Where does it start? Does it start with behavior change? And, and, and one of the reasons I want to kind of harp on this a little bit and kind of really make sure you see this well is because I believe that this is important for conflict resolution within families. This is important for how we bring up our children. This is important for how we handle um, the body of Christ in general. Is there somebody who rubs you the wrong way? What's wrong? What's happening here? And sitting down and talking with somebody and trying to come to terms with how we think is, this, is the beginning of the solution. Now, sometimes people think the right thing, but they don't evaluate the same information. That's where we get into not, the, not only the what, but the how. And sometimes people do things that are not consistent with how they think. That's a different problem. Okay. But the, solu the solution always begins with thought. There's a biblical principle that we have to understand here because oftentimes we are um, we are action-based individuals. We look at a person's actions and we don't address the thought. My daughters can probably tell you the exhausting conversations we've had when they were children. And we, when we deal with behavior issues and we would like, they would say, okay, I won't do that again. This is no, 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 no. We, we can't just leave it there. Right. It would be like, what was your thought process here? What were you thinking? And we didn't let them go. I don't know. That wasn't acceptable. Let's go ahead and figure this out, especially when they got older, because a physical punishment or, you know, a restriction of some sort did not fix the problem. It just delayed it. If we want to try to help them, we had to try to figure out exactly what they were thinking in order to be able to solve any issues. Now, I don't know how successful I was. It wasn't about me, but anyway, right? But it is an important idea to make sure that we understand that fixing a behavior issue only puts a Band-Aid on the problem. We have to understand the thought. So if you're dealing with a behavior issue, I'm talking about within myself, okay? I do this on a regular basis. What's wrong? The first thing I have to consider is what's my mind? What am I thinking? What's my knowledge? And, and, and how do I think about this situation? You always have to start there regardless of the issue. In fact, let's go ahead and take a little trip um, through the idea that every, that every problem is, is solved by adjusting our thinking in the Lord. Okay, So it's not just a matter of thinking properly in accordance with you know, philosophy or my friend or whatever. I don't adjust my thinking and kind of come into conformity with something outside of Scripture. First, I need to come into conformity with uh, scripture and that deals with both content and manner sometimes you know the right thing to think you just don't think it and that's a different process that's where you go through mind chains that's where you do you meditate and you and you consider information you talk about it and you try to overcome the problem of how we think about problems but let's go ahead and go over to first corinthians chapter five to see solutions to problems There's a problem in the Corinthian church. Do you remember what it was? Something quite nasty. We don't like to talk about it, right? But what's the actual issue here in 1 Corinthians 5? It is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles as someone would have his father's wife. Ew. Okay. Is that a problem? Yeah, what's the bigger issue that Paul's dealing with? It's the first two. Now that's an issue, right? That this has been not, and what's the issue is not the action, although that is a big issue, to be honest with you. The bigger issue is verse two. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. The mental attitude of the church has become complacent and they don't think the right thing about the situation. What would we do if there was an immoral act within this church that would become a distraction? Now, again, I don't want to sit there and like, you know, look at people's Netflix accounts. Uh, what I want to make sure that we understand is that there's something that's obvious within, the, con within the, co the construct of the church that becomes a distraction. How would we handle it? Do we go ignore it? 
and go, well, makes me uncomfortable, but at least they're coming. Or, or even worse still, if a person is um, doing something up front, singing or teaching or reading or passing out communion, and we know that they have a serious issue, do we allow that to occur? I hope we're all in agreement that we say, no, we don't allow that to occur. If they're a distraction, then we have to deal with the distraction. And that's what's going on in the Corinthians, is that they become permissive and they say, well, I'm not doing it. And if that's their situation, I'm not going to get involved. In this body of Christ, you cannot allow that kind of situation to just go unchecked. It needs to be checked. And so Paul is going to deal with, in chapter 5, this situation, dealing with the church's mental attitude towards overt and distracting sin within the body of Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm not going to read all of 11 through 21. This was a discussion that I've had with uh, uh, some of the pastor friends of mine on, and, um, and dealing with this question about is Paul talking about how to be initially justified before God to Peter, which became the solution, the conclusion that no, he is talking about living our life as a believer. And Peter had an issue. Peter's issue was not his words, it was his actions. So when Peter came to Antioch, Paul opposed him to his face because he stood condemned for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. What's the problem? The problem is I'm over here having a great time eating with Gentiles, not washing my hands and eating bacon. It's fantastic. And all of a sudden, certain Jews came in. He goes, you know what? I don't want to be offensive, and so I'm going to go over, over here and eat with them. What did that just demonstrate to the Gentiles that he was eating with before? There's a better way. Did he say anything inappropriate? Okay, but it, basically, he, as an apostle, demonstrated to these Gentile believers that coming over here is better. And therefore, enticing individuals to go, well, then I should also practice the same kind of washing rituals, or if that was the case, or not eat certain foods, or circumcise myself and be like a Jew in order to be able to be on this side of the table. That was the issue. Did, was Peter immoral? Did Peter have anything? Did Peter say anything? No, he just by a simple act. And we were talking about this, and I think um, I'm not sure who it was, but somebody mentioned the fact that Peter probably wasn't disingenuous here. He probably didn't want to offend the Jewish believers coming up from from Jerusalem, and so he did something that he felt was you know didn't want to offend them, didn't want to make them nervous. So Paul deals with him the entire time, and, and how does he do so? Peter, don't do that again. I'm warning you now as another apostle of Jesus Christ. If you do that again, we're throwing you out of the club. Or does he go through a mind change exercise, demonstrating truth through Scripture, understanding the what is right and what is wrong, effectively changing in Peter's mind what he did was wrong. So he, he changed his mind, and then you go back to Acts 15 when Peter actually addresses this question peter speaks almost identical what paul says the word of god there was this harmony there was an issue and so peter and paul had to come to terms and think the same thing and the word god was effectual in changing peter's mind so that he actually understood the problem james chapter 4 James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This gets a little bit more to the point of the matter. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, you, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. 
so that you spend it on your pleasures. So here the overall main issue is what? The source of quarrels, conflicts, fights, murder. I don't think that's speaking tongue in cheek. Remember, we talked about James chapter 4. There were people who died at the hands of other believers because of greed. Why? Because they're looking at their they're, they're looking at life with the wrong motivation. They're looking at life trying to gain physical things rather than promote spiritual things. So what is the solution? Now, in James, you could talk about how he tries to fix that. I'm going to use this as generalistic. He's identifying the problem here in James. The problem is their motivation, their thinking. Now, can you go ahead and change a person's knowledge about a situation, convict them of what is right or wrong, and they still have a problem later on? Absolutely. But that's not, we're not talking about the, the, the steps of the solution. We're talking about the first initial steps. Okay? The first initial steps in the book of Philippians... Paul brings out very clearly in that, change their mind. And once again, if the problem for these two women is personal, let's talk about it for just a second. If, if the problem is personal, if they're fighting one amongst themselves, their first solution is to think after Christ. Who has a problem with who? What are they thinking about? Are they treating each other the right way? If Christ loves you and Christ loves me, then shouldn't I love you and shouldn't you love me? There's a, there's a, there's a situation there that needs to be corrected if it's personal. If they are in conflict with the church because their doctrine is wrong, well, then they need to make sure that they come together with the church, discuss the doctrines of God, find out what Paul is saying, and come into conformity with the word of God. I think that's more accurate in the context of the text, but I'm not going to sit there and be, you know, I'm not, that's not the hill I'm going to die on. You know, people want to say, oh, I just think they're fighting amongst each other. Okay, whatever. Either way, you have the same solution. Think like Christ, the mind of Christ. As a preview, let us consider all the letters connected. Is that too, uh, that's not far-fetched, is it? I don't think so. And understand um, and discover the verses 4 through 9 are the specific solution to Philippians 4, 2 through 3. Is there a problem? Is there a, is there a quarrel? Is there a conflict? Is, are we not thinking the same thing? If that is the case, then how do we fix it? Philippians 4, 4 through 9 is actually one of the ways to make sure that we are all unified in how we think. In verse 3, they need help. Paul beseeches the true companion. Uh, the true companion is a singular masculine term, um, and, and it's literally translated, or fellow, uh, it's basically yoke fellow, someone who is cut from the same cloth. We don't know the name, um, and it's generic statement, but there's only one person that we know of in the context of Philippians who would be considered this individual who is not there yet. Now, if I could say who, who in the scriptures together would be Paul's yoke fellow, would be Timothy, but Timothy's not there yet. This letter preceded him. Okay, who carried the letter? If you go back to go to chapter four and also to chapter two, it is Epaphroditus. Regardless of who it is, though, I don't I don't want to say it is Epaphroditus, but I think it makes the most sense. However, the the instruction is clear. I think the person who read this knew exactly who they were talking about. But the encouragement to this true companion is to help these women. So I think Epaphroditus is also best suited for that, having come directly from Paul. These two women also are praised, regardless of their issue. They're praised. These two women, Clement, and the rest of Paul's fellow workers are mentioned in the same breath. Indeed, true companion, I ask you, help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement, also that the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. If what I think is accurate, that these two women are the subject matter of chapter 3, then these two women potentially could be called enemies of the cross of Christ. But look how they're talked about here. They have 
shared my struggle for the cause of the gospel, and their names are written in the book of life. Isn't that encouraging? It doesn't, see, their issues do not, their issues do not negate their activity of what they've done before. It's not erased, nor their position in the book of life. This should be comforting and motivating. For these two women to read this and to have Paul say these things about them, Regardless of whatever problem is ailing them, he is concerned about them. He wants them to think the same thing in the Lord. He has individuals who is there to help them deal with whatever issues they have, which I'm primarily thinking is doctrinal. But they shared my struggle, which is used back in 127, and their names are written in the book of life. How comforting is that? That even if we're at odds, we can understand that we are still unified because of who we are in Christ. Overall, the main lesson of, the, of, of this particular um, two verses, I don't want it to be understated or yeah, I don't mind overstating it. But it cannot be understated. If we have an issue, if there's an issue uh, personality wise, doctrinal wise, conflict of any kind in the family, in the church, wherever it may be, the solution begins with thought. What is the Bible? The Bible is, is made up of words, the word of God, the thoughts of God put on paper so that we come into conformity with his way of thinking, with what he wants us to think, so that we can have true peace. And what's next? You want peace? You want internal peace? You want peace within the church? You want peace without? Chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And we'll pick up with that next hour. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for your truth. Help us to, to gain insight from your word. Help us to think the same thing. Not you come to me or I go to you um, as individuals, but us go to you, Lord, for your words, your thoughts, that we may become unified because we have an objective truth. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll reset the broadcast.